Hi, this is Eric from Cafe Watercolor and welcome back to another long landscape painting video. Today we're going to look at my painting of Snoqualmie Falls. So before anybody asks me how do I do the animation earlier, I use Plotiverse and After Effect. But that's all I'm going to say because this is not a motion graphic channel so I'm not going to talk about it. There are a lot of tutorial on YouTube that you can watch and learn how to do something like this so I won't be spending time on that. I am very happy with this painting so maybe that's why I spent so much time on making the animation and trying to get more out of it. So anyways, this is Snowgomi Falls. It is about 30 minutes to the east from where I live. So in Pacific Northwest, you got the ocean on the west and the mountains on the east, which is very wonderful because you can literally go from hiking and river fishing to surfing at the coast in one day. Anyways, I took this photo a while back after a Saturday brunch with my family. There's a hotel restaurant right next to the waterfall and with a few steps you can see this grand view of the waterfall. I saw the waterfall is very beautiful but the main thing that caught my eyes is the scale and the composition of the scenery. You have this huge waterfall with a house on top of it. The mist from the waterfall makes the bottom of the rock face off quite a bit. It almost feels like the house is floating. I also think this is a good chance to let watercolor does what it does best, which is just let it flow. It is a relatively simple scenery in terms of drawing, but like I said, the scale is what makes the scenery interesting. So that's something I really need to watch out for, which is also the reason you see me erase and redraw the house. The house is important, but it doesn't mean that I make it bigger than it should. The rest of the drawing is pretty much just me trying to get some organic line work and get the feeling of the shape. Once blocked out the shape, I just go straight into the painting. So you can see the palette that I'm working on. I just add some water to the leftover colors on the palette and make that into my neutral gray for my first wash. I'm using a big squirrel brush so it holds a lot of water which will make my first wash easier. Since it is an overcast day, the sky is pretty light. What we need to know about an overcast day is that it is a lot brighter than a sunny blue sky. Imagine sun is a light bulb and the light it emits is through a soft box. The light got diffused and evenly spread out instead of a single hot spot. And that is exactly what happened here. While we don't see the sun that is super bright, we do see the sunlight through the diffuser that covers up the whole sky. So even though we don't feel the temperature and the energy of the sun during an overcast day, the sky is actually very bright. So with that in mind, we need to keep the first wash of the sky very light and transparent. If you mix a dark value for the sky, just because it's an overcast day, you are going to lose a lot of light in your painting, and that's not good. So the top of the sky is a little bit cooler, and as the wash comes down, it gets a bit warmer. But keep the first wash pretty wet. You can see the bead gather here, and that is very useful to bring the wash down. So in this painting, I'm actually trying to do a little bit more in the first wash. I start to paint a little bit of value for the areas that are going to have trees and the rocks. They are still very, very light, though it is mostly just for myself to be conscious about what's going to be there later. The important thing for the first wash is to keep it clean and preserve the highlight, such as the top of the path, the roof, and of course the waterfall. The key to keeping the wash clean is to know when to stop working. You can see here that I'm mostly trying to continue the wash down. I do a bit of wet on wet work, but mostly on the bottom where the wash is still wet and fresh. You don't see me go back to the sky because it is drying. 
Even if I'm not completely happy with it, it's better to just let it be. If I go back to the top of the wash where it's half dry and starting to mess with it, it will be ruined and start get dirty very easily. So timing is very important. Once you reach the area where you need to slow down to preserve the highlight, you need to be ready to let the wash start to dry. The bead is still there and that's a good indication that I can still continue the wash down. The rest of it is pretty much just the waterfall so I just load up my brush with lots of water and bring the whole thing down. It's important to finish the wash because I don't want any hard edge just yet. And I also want to make it wet enough so I will have time to do some more wet on wet work on the waterfall. Here I'm just starting to wet the paint all over. I actually use a paper towel and press into some of the area that I want to keep them very light. If I don't use enough water here, it will dry a lot faster and I won't be able to do as much work on it. So the first wash is usually quite wet. Now while the wash is still wet, I start to put some pigments into the waterfall. Because I'm paint tilted, the paint will flow down because of the gravity. And I just play with this effect quite a bit, splatter some waters and just let it flow and create waterfall on the paper for me. So as you can imagine, I had a lot of fun playing with it. This is watercolor at its best. Just drop in the paint and see its magic. This stage is often my favorite stage in the painting. I have a lot of freedom to play with it and watch watercolor does its thing. And at the same time, the first wash dry very light because it's very wet. So I know that whatever I paint in the first wash usually will fade back quite a bit as I start to do the second wash. I rotate the paper a little bit so it will flow a bit to the side as well. Otherwise the pigment can gather at the bottom a bit too much. Splatter some more water. Have a little bit more fun with it. And when I think it looks good, I just stop and let it resolve itself and dry. So after that's dry, I come back and re-wet some of the area on the background trees. And I mix a very cool green that is less watery. run my brush across and you can see when it hits the wet area it will become softer and lighter. This is a good way to create edge and value variety for an area. So it feels like there are patches of fogs covering the background. This is a great way to show atmosphere in a clean and natural way in watercolor. No other medium will be able to do the same and when you think about it, fog and mist are made with water particles. So watercolor is probably the most natural medium to paint those. While painting the tree, it is important to use different shades of green. If you only use one type of green, the scenery will look dead very quickly. Green is this weird color and it has so many different shades. So for this reason, I don't really have a green color in my palette. Cobalt turquoise is the closest color to green for me. By mixing cobalt turquoise with different warm colors, such as burnt sienna, yellow ochre, cadmium yellow and stuff, you get different shades of green. Use them wet on wet like this gives your green variations. It is really important to paint a group of tree and bushes like this. 
Because when you have a forest of trees like this, you want them to read as a single shape at the first glance. But within that single shape, color and value variation will keep it from looking flat. The strength of watercolor is this type of lost and found edges and hints of details in the atmosphere that will make the watercolor painting soft and beautiful. Carefully leave out some highlight on the roof of the house. I mix a darker color and paint the house in the middle. This is the main focus of the painting, so I definitely want to separate them. In the photo, you see the tree on the back is as dark as the house. But in my painting, I kept them really light so the house can come in front of them visually. If I copy everything I see from the photo, it's not going to look good. This is my painting, so I do what I know is best for it. Like I mentioned before, I think this is artist's responsibility to process and present the scenery that we see in a personal, tasteful way. Here I connect the shape between the house and the background trees. So it separates but also connect it. You can tell it's different depths, but the house is also belonging to the same scenery as the trees. Connecting shape like this is really important and it can really make a difference in your painting's atmosphere. If there's enough definition of the shape, you can probably lose one or two edges to fade that into atmosphere by connecting the shape around it. This stage is always a little bit tricky to me. I've done first wash and set up the basic backdrop. It's time to paint the main element. And it is the first time you start to make some darker and almost permanent marks. Shapes need to look good but not too tight. So there are quite a bit of mental pressure here. So a lot of time I get in common like, you make it look so easy. I make it look really easy because I try to make it as clean as possible without a lot of dabbings. But in my brain, there's actually a lot of pressure and thinking going on. So trust me when I tell you that this is not as easy as it looks. And even though I'm relatively comfortable with watercolor and painting sceneries, this is still a challenging stage for me every time. I definitely don't want to pretend like I got everything figured out and I don't struggle with this anymore. I still struggle through every painting that I do. And I personally don't think that's going away anytime soon. The best thing to do is to just concentrate, really observe what the watercolor is doing and hope for the best. I make the color of the structure a bit more intense by dropping in some darker mixture, painting the dark window and the water tunnel while it is still wet. So we have a nice soft shape. And I mix a light green color and paint the water surface. It's amazing how clean it is compared to the waterfall. This gives us an interesting contrast between still water and moving water. The water on top next to the house is almost mirror-like, while the waterfall has a lot of moving foams, details, and noise. A little separation between the water next to the house and the waterfall. They built a hydropower plant in this waterfall, so that's why we're seeing some structures here. Exactly where and how it works, I don't really know, but it's definitely a very interesting fact about this place. When I shared this painting on my Facebook page, one person said her husband proposed to her while they were on a helicopter flying above this waterfall. I thought that was really interesting and it was amazing how this simple painting can trigger some wonderful memories people have. Everyone has a different connection to the place. For me, this place is remind me how 
beautiful and accessible the nature of Pacific Northwest is. Now it's time to paint the rocks, because it's an overcast day. There's no distinct lighting direction for the rocks, which I think it actually worked quite well for this painting because I can just focus on the shape, the depths, and the atmosphere. If we have a direct sunlight, we might have too many things to worry about, and the painting might actually not be as impactful as it can be. I am using a Kulinski brush to do the rock. I use that because it's a bit easier to have interesting looking dry brush marks, which is definitely something I want to have for these rocks because it can hint some water and foam splashes. I spray some water on it so it doesn't look so stiff. Anytime you have a dark solid shape like this, you can splatter or spray some water on it. A little of that can help the shape to look more alive. Here I started to define the waterfall a bit more. What I do is I paint some shapes first, then I use clean water to soften the bottom of the shapes. Because waterfall has this layering and stacking look to them, so what I'm essentially doing is painting some very soft shadow that's casting by layers above. But they are very soft because it's semi-transparent and the water is moving and it's an overcast day. And since it's the first time I paint waterfall like this, I wasn't sure how it's going to turn out. But since I do know what I'm painting, I know that it will be more or less pretty representational of what I'm thinking. The key is to have things a bit more defined on the top, but a lot softer and washed out at the bottom because all of the mist. Here is the close up of how I paint the waterfall. So just paint some shape and keep the brush stroke random and organic. Paint several of those shapes and come back with water to soften and connect them. And you can also see I spray some water on it to break it up a little bit. Come back to it with darker mixture while it is still wet. There is an incredible amount of details here, but my job as an artist is to simplify and give my own take on it. Copy all the details and make it photo real is not really what I do. If the overall experience for the viewer doesn't change, lose some detail probably won't matter much. Painting the dark gap in between the waterfalls. Those are actually the rocks underneath the water. It's a nice visual break in the waterfall so we don't have foams and white everywhere. They are essential for this painting. It'll pretty much be the same look with a darker, sharper edge on top and it'll fade off as it comes down. Since the water spread out a bit more at the bottom, we started to get more water overlap and it will become more light and misty. One thing I do really want to mention is that the overall big structure of the waterfall, you have basically two surfaces here, one facing up and one facing towards us. The top of the waterfall is receiving a lot of the skylight, and as the surface transition forward into vertical part of the waterfall, it starts to receive less light, and it becomes slightly darker. So we see this transition in value. When you focus on a small part of the waterfall, it may seem to be really light and there's a lot of contrast. But when you look at it as a whole image, you can see the value transition from light to midtone. So this is something definitely you need to watch out for, focusing on the whole picture, 
looking at the big picture. Don't lose the overall value relationship as a whole picture. I mentioned it before. Our focus point is actually very, very little. You might think you can look at everything at once because your eyes is constantly moving. But if you're just focusing on one thing, one single spot, and you don't move it, you actually start to see a lot of details and the value differences, and that's all you see. So it's very important that you step back once in a while and look at the whole picture, see if it's working out, see the big value relationship is working out for you. So now I'm pretty much just repeating the process of painting the gap and the waterfall. In here, you can see I'm using a big brush with just water to really try to fade everything off in the bottom. I know there are more details in the photo, but again, I am not planning to copy everything in the photo, so I am painting off a lot of detail. I'm skipping a lot of detail that is not going to help the picture. And while I'm doing that, I'm spraying and splatter some water on it, really just trying to keep the paint flowing and break things up a bit so it doesn't look as stiff. I grab a paper towel and just wipe the bottom very lightly to really fade that off. It needs to be done very lightly. If you press down too hard, you can damage the paper. After that is dry, I am able to add a little bit more detail. But it's very important to keep it subtle. The main thing I want to do is just to give the waterfall a bit more definition, nothing more. If I start to go into the micro detail and all the foam and shape, it will start killing the sense of movement of the water. The water is constantly moving. So to avoid my painting look like a still photograph, I need to keep things loose and convey the sense of movement. The point of doing a watercolor painting of a waterfall is to introduce the sense of movement. Similar to long exposure photography, it captures the movement in a still image rather than freezes it. Now that I'm pretty much done with the waterfall, I go back to paint another layer over the house just to make it darker. Adding some more suggestions and structures, the electric pool, some tall equipments that I don't really know what it is. But these little details helps to make things look more sophisticated and push the contrast a little bit more. So you have this man-made structure and the nature's surrounding. That gives a very interesting contrast. This is also the good time to add some dark windows, door, and some hints of shadow underneath the roof. Since I painted the dark rock in the waterfall, I have a great value reference. So I know that the structure needs to be darker and how dark they should be. I also start to paint its reflections on the water surface. Again, the water surface needs to be clean so I wet the whole area and drop in the dark to let it flow down seamlessly. I also start to paint another layer on the background with a very slightly darker tone just so that it won't look as flat. This just makes the background read a little bit better without losing its depth. This also helps the small house in the background more defined and readable. I mix some darker green color and I bring the dark bushes on the right of the house out. I want them to lead to the tall pine tree that's going to be in the front. Again, connecting shape is very important for the painting to look fluid and help the viewer's eyes to flow better. This pine tree is actually very important and pretty similar to what Bob Ross always did on his painting, his happy trees. This connects the foreground into the background compositionally and the scale of the tree establish the depths. Because there's not a lot of perspective going on here, so we really need to convey 
the depths of the painting by using atmospheric perspective and scale. Again, I'm using a Kolinsky brush for the pine tree, so I get more interesting details and dry brush marks. While doing that, I also paint some taller trees in the background. It might change the silhouette of the background, but the value stays the same, so it remains in the back. It just looks a little bit more interesting. I have been stalling and avoid painting the rock on both sides, but at this point I have to paint it. The whole painting is looking very decent, but it lacks the weight and the mysterious feeling I want it to have. So I mix a dark color for the rock on the right. I need quite a bit of dark mixture, so I use a bigger brush to do that. That way I don't need to keep remixing the color while I'm painting it. I test the color a little bit here on the top of the rock. After I think it looks good, I take a bigger brush and start to really paint that rock out. I want to keep this shape as clean as I can, so I avoid doing too much dabbing. I slow down at some of the area, especially the edge, because I want the edge of the waterfall well defined, especially on the top. I don't like to talk about color too much because as you can see I pretty much just mix a bunch of colors together to make my dark of the rock. Ultramarine blue, burnt umber, burnt sienna, some alizarin crimson and neutral tint. So there's a lot of colors. You can say that I'm just mixing a bunch of stuff to create dirt. But as long as the value is right and the color temperature is fine, I'm good with it. After we have that, I just take a big brush and use some clean water to fade that off on the bottom. It's a very natural way to paint the mist, and that's what makes the scenery look light and airy. And before it's dry, some wet on my work to make some variations on the rock. I also try to add some more pigments on top because what happened is that the paint will flow down and loses its dark value. So dropping some drier, darker mixture on top will make it regain its dark value again. And if you do that while the wash is still wet, you will get a very seamless transition from dark to light. I fade off the rock on the right a lot higher than the photo. I only need it to be there to frame the waterfall and to add some weight. If I extend it too far down, it can actually look distracting. So again, make your own decision when you are doing your own painting. There's a bead gather at the bottom because it's quite wet. So the water flow down and gather there. So I take the paper towel and take that out. I also use it to lift some of the paint so it can feel even softer. Now onto the left rock. The same process, I mix some dark paint with a bunch of different colors. And as you can see, I am not really thinking about what color I put in it. I just look at the color and trust my eyes. So I always tell my students that I mix color with my eyes, not formulas. I make some green colors and I drop them on the top of the rock because there are some vegetations growing on the top of the rock so I want to hint that. Dropping those green color on top and it will naturally blend in with the rest of the color of the rock. I basically just want to make it a dark foreground shape with some variation so I am not putting too much detail here. The important thing for these rocks is their silhouette. It is even hard to see the details in the photo because it's pretty much the same value. So what's really going to make it look like rocks are the silhouette. Take the time to articulate the silhouette and make them look elegant and interesting. And here I'm doing the same thing with clean water and fade off the bottom of the rock into the atmosphere. Splatter and spraying some water to give some more texture. 
and watercolor does its wonder by giving me the natural texture of the rocks. I drop some more dark mixtures on it. When doing so, it's better to have a drier mixture and drop it lightly with the tip of your brush instead of pressing the brush down. Some more wet on wet work, splattering and playing with it, and I just leave it be. The painting is pretty much done here, but I feel there needs to have a little bit more life to it. Because of the scale and the distance of the subject, there's no figure in this, but I can still paint some birds flying. It'll be helpful because some hints of bird can add more life to the scenery, as well as create some sense of space in the white sky. So I just very loosely paint a few birds in. As simple as they are, I don't really want to overdo it. The sky is nice and bright and clean, so I really think about where will they be placed and how to space them. Some final touches, and we are finished. This is such a wonderful painting for watercolor. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, drop me a comment down below. Be sure to check out my website for my paintings, including this one. Sign up to get watercolor PDF guide and my updates. Thank you, and I will see you again next time.